Man has been carving stone for some 6,000 years and more. There's little new about the act of fashioning art from the rocks of the earth. It's the eternal character of the finished work which makes the art. Cicero once said, all arts relating to human life are linked together by a subtle bond. The black man carved stone in Tasmania long before the coming of the white. Long before the sails of the explorers hove within sight of our shores, he patiently grooved patterns in the rock. Whether they're symbolical or representative is now lost to us. The pattern of our modern culture was set with the invasion of soldiery, convicts and settlers. Golden sedimentary rock was shaped into mansions and monuments. The acorn and the angels held sway and then fell into obscurity, but no longer. In Tasmania, reproach has given way to search. The process of rediscovery was never more ardent, more vigorous. The countryside has been quartered for its treasures, not the least of which are our colonial carvings. Robin Boyd said, the back blocks of Tasmania are practically undisturbed for the searcher after old dignity that's lost behind the age of featureism. The rural quiet contains many a carved gem, even a chiselled kangaroo and emu, forerunners of our national coat of arms. Come to Green Hill in lilac time and see, set in glowing red brick, this carving that may have been inspired by a coin from Spanish Mexico, or away to the highlands of Bothwell, where a master of the carving art a poet with a chisel, left on the face of the Tower of St. Luke's these chronicles and summary of human experience. The Bothwell chain gang heard his footsteps, and the Clyde stone was cut to his Gothic inspiration. Away to the southeast, Port Arthur, where old wounds are being healed by human care, and mown pasture houses both a peasant and a superior stone art. A noseless finial from the shell of the hospital. an exquisite floral piece from a sacred stoop. The last resting place of a city lion. Seldom was a carving made for itself, except in the mind of the carver. Government house was built, the finest in the state and along with it, a splendid stone fence with its various patterned roses. The carvers had humour displayed well above the level of the eye. Clever gargoyles with their hints of fun and mockery.
convict carver, with a nice sense of proportion and the current fashion, sculpt this sundial, now in the ground of the Sheeling, in the ripe old village of Pontville. He too had a sense of fun. And what tickled the fancy of the carver who liked a knot of stone in the wall at Beaufront? And what whim seized him who engraved the smile on this mill face at Nant? For certain life was not all beer and skittles, but neither was it all misery. There was time to laugh amidst the growing pains, time to plant oaks and elms, time to think of life beginning, as well as that which ended. The acorn and the angels are well established in our state. Angels galore tell their story in stone, and something of the mood and mind of their carvers, exuberant, floating on a cloud of stone. Some with a hint of a smile, a hint of peace. Yet others, sad, lonely. All by the artisans and artists of yesteryear, when Tasmania was Van Diemen's land. shadowy hands of the carvers reach out from the past to delight us with simple things as well as their serious works. Masks for barns and stables, a coat of arms for a mansion. No horses need thirst, nor men in their old age struggle up the steep-sided coach. The trough and the stepping stone were there. The primacy of the golden fleece was quaintly chiselled. Time and nature were symbolised in a pouncing falcon. Milestones by the score. Van Diemen's Land carvers saw their most magnificent triumph in the Ross Bridge. Time has proven it to be more than an answer to a need to cross a river. It's a work of art in its own right. The finest colonial carving, not only in Tasmania, but in the Australian Commonwealth. Northumbrian highwaymen carved it and were pardoned for their superb essay. One of them, Daniel Herbert, was a gifted man, draftsman, musician, poet, sculptor, who sleeps on the hill overlooking the scene of his labours. Arch after arch, stone after stone, is enriched from the sources of fable, legend and reality. From an imagination clear-minded enough to see the significance of blue gum and wattle, along with the shamrock, thistle and rose. The products of the land immortalised, sheep and wool bales. Dream like fish of the sea. There was a place too for the images on the playing cards, a king and a queen. Room two for a schoolmaster and a philosopher. And one whom legend says is Governor Arthur himself. These carvings and others hidden deep in the Tasmanian countryside were informed by the true spirit of art and are a part of that great indivisible heritage.